the word that Isaiah son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of all mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On Thursday evening, not long after the table was cleaned off and the leftovers were packed away, we began preparing for Christmas. It was like the starting gun of a race. Decorations started going up, holiday songs filled the air. We double-checked the Black Friday specials in the email inbox. We pulled out the Christmas lists to double-check where we were. I'm not talking about just my family here. I'm talking about all of us. And a few of us are overachievers, and we started on this back in October. But we're all in it now. The clock has started on the Christmas season. You might have wandered into church and thought, well, why are we talking about Advent? It's the Christmas season. Why is the church so out of step as to begin this four-week season of Advent when we all just started decorating for Christmas? Advent is a different kind of season that the church religiously observes. Advent is a time of waiting and hoping. We've changed our Advent color from purple to blue because blue is the symbol of hope. In Advent, we revisit the prophetic promises of the gospel. These promises are like light. These prophetic promises of the gospel are like light that shines on a path through the darkness. They are like the light that shines from a house welcoming you in from the night. This Advent, we will walk with Isaiah each Sunday. The lectionary text from Isaiah will be our guide in worship as we look to see the prophet's vision and the light that the prophet sees. This morning we begin with Isaiah 2. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Let us pray. Living God, help us to walk alongside the prophet and to see the vision that Isaiah sees. Let us see it now, not in the context of an ancient world, but let us see it now in the context of our world, as light for our path, that we too may walk in the light of the Lord, in whose name we pray, Amen. The title of the sermon series this Advent is, What Are You Waiting For? Now, usually that question is asked in a way of saying, it's time to get moving. What are you waiting for? But I'm really interested. What are you waiting for? Everyone's waiting for something. We're waiting for children or for grandchildren to be born. We're waiting for relationships to develop. We're waiting for a plan to unfold. We're waiting for help to return. We're waiting for a new stage of life to come. All of us are waiting for something. Some of us are simply waiting to die. All of us are waiting for something. It is an irreducible fact of human life. As Lou Smead says in the quote in the front of your bulletin, as creatures who are without the power to create the future we hope for, we are stuck waiting. We are made to wait. It's important to know what you're waiting for. Because what you're waiting for is a clue to what you're hoping for. 
It's important to know what you're hoping for. Because what you're hoping for has the power to shape your life. And what has the power to shape your life has the power to shape your soul. What are you waiting for? It's another way of saying, what are you hoping for? If you're hoping to nurture a loving family, then that hope guides your actions and your decisions and where you invest your energy and your resources. If you're hoping to climb high on your career ladder, then that hope guides your actions and your decisions and where you invest your resources. Even if you're just hoping to have a really good time before you check out, that hope guides your actions and where you invest your resources and your decisions. What we hope for gives shape to our lives, and so it's important to know what you're hoping for. The prophets of sacred scripture write down their visions in order to shape our hopes. These prophets do not write simply to tell us what's going to happen in the future. They are not writing to tell us when the world will end. If they were doing that, their words would be long since bankrupt. Prophecies like beat their swords into plowshares would ring hollow after millennia of warfare. Prophets do not write to tell us what the road looks like in the future. Prophets write to shine the light of the future on the road for today. Let me say that again. Prophets do not write to tell us what the road looks like in the future. Prophets write to shine the light of the future on the road we walk today. Prophets write to shape the hopes that you live with today. Because if they can shape your hopes, they can shape your life. And if they can shape your life, they can shape your soul. So what are you hoping for? Do you know? Are your hopes deep enough to be worthy of your life? Are your hopes strong enough to bear the weight of the glory of your soul? In the normal run-up for Christmas and the advertisements that come our way, we see things like iPads and Lexus with a bow on it and a trip to somewhere special. Those are good hopes. But are they worthy of shaping your life? Are they strong enough to bear the weight of the glory of your soul? What are you hoping for? In chapter 2, Isaiah sets before us a hope that is worth, worthy of shaping a life. It is a hope for peace and wholeness and restoration. The chapter begins, The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. I want you to notice that Isaiah saw a word. The verb there means to envision. The word came to the prophet, not as something to be heard, but as something to be seen, a new way of seeing. It came to him as light in the darkness. Chapter 1 sets the context for the darkness that Isaiah lived in. The countryside is desolate. The cities are burned. The fields are overgrown with weeds. Strangers have conquered the land. Jerusalem has fallen into sin and degradation. Where once there was righteousness, now there is murder. Thieves sit at the tables of princes. Everyone loves a bribe and everyone runs after graft. That's what Isaiah saw until God gave him a new way of seeing. A new word in the form of a new vision. Light in the darkness. Psychologists call it reframing. If you can take the present reality and put it into a new frame, you can find hope and see it in a new light. Others of us might call it a fresh perspective. If you can take the same reality and see it from a new angle, there's hope. You see it in a new light. Here in the mountains, our eyes are opened by fresh perspectives all the time. That's why I go hiking. Some go for exercise. I go for a fresh perspective. If you walk out the doors here, you see downtown Asheville. 
from one view. If you go up Town Mountain, you see downtown Asheville from another view. If you drive up Elk Mountain, you see downtown Asheville from yet another view. If you serve at Saturday Sanctuary, you see downtown Asheville from yet another view. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah as a way of seeing. It came as a new perspective and point of view. That's the raw material of hope. When you look at the same reality in the same way, it's hard to find any hope. When you need hope, it helps to look at the same reality in a new frame, from a new perspective. It's the stuff that hope is made of. The vision of the prophet Isaiah takes us up onto the mountain to give us a new way of seeing so that we can live in our present reality with a hope that is worthy of shaping our lives. So what is Isaiah's hope? At the center of Isaiah's hope is the living God. The mountain of Yahweh's house is higher than every other mountain. And peoples from every nation and all over the world stream like water running uphill to the house of the Lord to hear the wisdom and the instruction of Yahweh. There on the mountain of the Lord, Yahweh is their mediator. Yahweh settles their disputes and arbitrates their disagreements. So there can be peace. And because there is peace, they beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. I didn't know what a plowshare was until this week. But it's the cutting edge of a plow. And a pruning hook or a pruning knife that, that takes care of a tree. No longer will they settle their arguments through violence. No longer will they study war. Instead, the tools of war can be turned to the instruments of cultivation. Swords that were used to destroy their neighbors can now be used to plow the ground that will feed their neighbors. Spears that used to murder their adversary can now be used to prune the trees that will grow the fruit, that will build the community and create human flourishing. Notice it is not the Lord that beats their shares, their plow, swords into plowshares. It is they who beat their swords into plowshares. It is not the Lord who turns their spears to pruning hooks. It is they who turn their spears to pruning hooks. Because the wisdom of Yahweh is at the center of their lives. And so there is peace. In Isaiah's present reality, the Lord has been pushed to the side. In Isaiah's present reality, no one runs to the holy city for wisdom and instruction. They run to the holy city for bribes and graft. In Isaiah's present reality, no one is cultivating gardens and nurturing a flourishing life. In Isaiah's present reality, the land is overgrown because the tools of gardening have been made into tools of warfare. But Isaiah, with the vision of a prophet, sees beyond the present reality. Those of you who wear bif bifocals have a leg up on the rest of us with this. If you wear bifocals, you know that you can see close up and you can see far away. Isaiah has bifocal vision. He can see the present reality close up, but he also can see a different reality far away. He can see by the light of the Lord as the light shines on his present darkness. In that light, there is flourishing, not destruction. In that light, there is peace and not violence. In that light, the fullness of life is restored. In that light, the wisdom of Yahweh is at the center and swords become plowshares. Now that is a hope worthy of shaping your life. That is a hope strong enough to bear the weight of the glory of your soul. That is also a hope that sounds terribly naive and unrealistic. Swords into plowshares sounds more like a pipe dream than a hope. Spears into pruning hooks sounds more like wishful thinking than reasonable expectation. 
Some cynic turned this phrase around and said, those who beat swords into plowshares will plow for those who do not. That seems closer to the reality of the world. The way of the world is the way of war and violence. It is the strong men who win. The nation with the most powerful weapons and the greatest technological capability is the safest. Did you know that as a nation we now live in a state of perpetual warfare? Our drones fly all over the world every day, dropping bombs daily, and the pilots who fly them fly them from the comfort of an office. The bombs that they drop kill those who they target, but the bombs that the drones drop also decimate the souls of the pilots who fly them. Because flying a drone looks a lot like a video game, except the pilot knows it's not. And they go home and sleep in their bed with the guilt of war, daily. Where is the hope? Where is the light in the darkness? One of the greatest dangers the world faces today is the threat of nuclear war. For someone who grew up in kindergarten and elementary school in the 1980s, that sounds like a long ago conversation from yesterday, the threat of nuclear war. And yet, it's a conversation that is very relevant today. A young dictator on the other side of the globe detonates nuclear weapons under the sea just to show that he can. He has no interest in plowshares. He is only interested in the sword. Spin the globe a little more, you come to the Middle East and the nation of Iran. They too are developing nuclear technology. Are they interested in swords or plowshares? We're not sure. And it's frightening. Where is the hope? Where is the light in the darkness? Too many of us give in to the cynical shrug, that's just the way the world is. We decide to give up hope and walk in the dark. Where is the hope? Where is the light? I believe it is in the light given to Isaiah. The light given to Isaiah is a new way of seeing where the wisdom of Yahweh is at the center and nations are at peace. The energy and creativity and imagination, intelligence that is given now to making bombs and planes and ships might be given to housing and schools and food and health care. There is no need for war anymore. There is peace among nations. Does that sound realistic? Not at all. But why would you settle for reality when you can live with hope? Let me ask that again. Why would you settle for reality when you can live with hope? This is the kind of hope that's worthy of your life. The vision of a world without war, a vision mandated by the great God of Zion, is more than a fanciful dream of a few overly optimistic peaceniks. When Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed of a world without racism, he was doing more than dreaming. He was casting a vision, a vision of the kingdom of God that we could live into. John Holbert writes, if we can see the vision, we can live into the future with it. We simply must see the visions that God has for us and live always into them and toward them. This is what Isaiah means when he says, walk in the light of the Lord. Walking in the light of God means letting the seeds of the kingdom of God take root in your soul and grow means letting this new way of seeing shape your plans, your energy, your imagination, your intelligence, your action, so that you do things that make for justice. You do things that establish peace. You, you turn swords into plowshares and bend spears into pruning hooks. You place the wisdom of Yahweh at the center of light. Walking in the light of God means walking in darkness with an inner light. It means an inner wisdom, an inner vision that the world around you may not share, but you bear the light anyway. 
Walking in the light of God means letting the hope of God's prophet become your hope. Your hope. This is a season for hope. All of us are waiting and hoping for something. The question is, is what you're hoping for strong enough to bear the weight of your soul and worthy of shaping your life? The prophet invites us into a new hope. Will we make it ours?